Good morning. So, today we will talk about clustering. In the earlier classes, so far in this course, we have mainly talked about supervised learning. In supervised learning, we have some data which are labeled and we try to learn a function. We want, we try to come up with a method to label unseen instances correctly. Today, we will look at unsupervised learning and we will look at one specific type of unsupervised learning which is called clustering. We will introduce what clustering is and in the subsequent classes we will uh, give illustrations of different specific clustering methods. In unsupervised learning, as we have discussed in the first class of this course, that we have data, but those data have no labels. So, we have unlabeled data instances and in unsupervised learning, we want to find hidden structure in the unlabeled data. So, we want to explore the data to find some structure in there but there is no gold standard or there is no, uh, no labels to say that this is what you get. Now, why would we be interested in this? When we have a large amount of data, unless we are able to group the data, we will not be able to do studies and do proper exploration of the data. For example, let us take the example of the plant and animal kingdom. So, biologists have studied the different species of plants and animals and come up with a grouping of them and these groups can be called clusters. They have grouped animals into vertebrates and invertebrates and then vertebrates as mammals, fish, etcetera. So, these labels were not given to the early scientists, but they have come up with these groupings based on species which share similar attributes and based on that this grouping has been done. Now, clustering is the most popular type of unsupervised learning. There are few other types of unsupervised learning which we will not talk about in this class. In clustering, the task is given a set of data instances. So, here you do not have earlier our sample contained x i y i values. Here the sample will contain only x 1, x 2, x 3, x n. So, only the data points are given and no output or no output label is given. So, given a set of these instances objects in clustering, we want to group the objects into clusters. So, we can find a cluster C 1, C 2, C 3. So, C 1 will contain a number of these items. Suppose x 2, x 3, x 7 go in C 1, x 1, x 4, x 10, x 11 go in C 2 and then x 5, x 6, x 8, x 9, x 12. So, so, these are the, suppose these are three different clusters. We come up with, a, given this sample, we come up with groups and how do we come up with groups? So, instances which belong to the same group would be in some way similar to each other, right. So, x 2, x 3, x 7 should have some similarity among each other, x 1, x 4, x 10, x 11 should have some similarity with each other and x 3 and x 4, two elements which belong to different clusters will be in some way dissimilar with each other. Based on this, we can come up with groups. Now, clustering is useful for many applications. For example, it can be used to automatically organize data. For example, the plant species or animal species or news documents or uh, books. It can be used for understanding hidden structure in data and sometimes clustering is used as pre-processing for further 
analysis of the data. Now, look, let us look at the slide to look at an application of news clustering. Some of you will have used Google News. In Google News, you will notice that the different news stories are grouped. For example, so this is one news story uh, is the, about the bombing of Istanbul airport uh, on 29th June 2016 and the news stories under that they are grouped together. So, this is unsupervised clustering because this particular news story was not given as a label to this, but the related news items were grouped together. So, Google News is an example of a system which does news clustering. Then this is an example of clustering of gene expression data. So, these genes are clustered based on uh, the, different, the gene expression. There are other applications for example, as I have talked about in biology, the classification of plant and animal kingdom given their features. In marketing, customer segmentation based on the database of customer data containing their properties and past buying records. These are very useful to marketing companies because based on the grouping of the customers, they can decide what type of promotions to target to each customer. A third example is clustering of web log data to discover groups of similar access patterns. And the fourth example is to recognize communities in social networks based on their similarities. Let us look at, in order to be, uh, talk about clustering algorithms, let us look at some example data. So, these are the data points, only the data points are given, their labels are not given. But in this particular data, you see visually that there are four natural clusters. And what a clustering algorithm is required to do is take this and come up with this four clusters. Ideally, this is what the clustering algorithm will do. So, there are different aspects of clustering. First of all, there is a clustering algorithm and there are different types of clustering algorithm. We will discuss a few of the clustering algorithms in the next few classes. There are algorithms which are partitional or divisional in nature, which takes the data and divides them into a number of groups. K means is an example of a partitional clustering algorithm. Then there are hierarchical clustering algorithms, which hierarchically divides the data into clusters. Hierarchical algorithms may be based on top down method or bottom up method, which is done in adaptive hierarchical clustering. Again, we will see that in the next class. There are other methods like model based methods, for example, mixture of Gaussians, density based methods like DB scan, etcetera. So, there is a clustering algorithm. Secondly, there is a distance or similarity function which the clustering algorithm uses or tries to optimize. We told earlier that in a cluster, the elements in a cluster are similar to each other and the elements belonging to two different clusters are different from each other. And to measure how similar or dissimilar two elements are, we have to use a metric or similarity or dissimilarity measure. Some possible measures are Euclidean distance, cosine distance, Pearson correlation coefficient and so on. Thirdly, one has to have a way of evaluating how good the clusters is. For that, one can look at different methods. For example, one can try to minimize the intra cluster distance of elements which belong to the same cluster and maximize the inter cluster distance elements that belong to different clusters. The quality of a clustering result depends on the algorithm, the distance function used and the application for which you are using it. So, these are some of the major clustering approaches, partitioning based methods, which involves constructing various partitions, hierarchical methods, which creates a hierarchical decomposition of the set of objects model based methods, which hypothesize a model for each cluster and finds the best fit of model to data. 
density based clustering algorithms which are guided by connectivity and density functions, graph theoretic clustering based on the under construction of a graph and looking at some uh, graph theoretic measures like min cut and so on. So, these are some of the different clustering approaches, some few of them we will talk about in this class. So, partitioning algorithms construct a partition of, so given a data sample, the partitioning algorithms will construct a partition of these into k clusters. So, k is given to the algorithm, it will find k clusters that optimizes the chosen criteria. Right? You may come up, the algorithm may come up with a global optimum of the chosen criteria or use a heuristic method and come up with a local optima. So, we will explore in detail the k means algorithm which comes up with a local optimum based on certain criteria. The second type of clustering algorithms is hierarchical clustering. For example, animals may be grouped into vertebrates and invertebrates. Vertebrates may be broken into fish, reptiles, amphibians, mammals and so on. This is an example of using a tree or hierarchical clustering. We will look at some methods for hierarchical clustering, which produces a nested sequence of clusters. You can, for example, you can use a partitional algorithm and recursively apply it to get a hierarchical clustering or you may do a bottom up clustering where you start with a large number with each cluster containing one item and repeatedly go on merging the clusters until you get one cluster and as a result you can get a nested tree. We will talk more about it in a later class. A third type of clustering is a model based cluster where given the data points, you hypothesize a model. For example, you can think of each cluster being represented by a Gaussian distribution with a mean and a standard deviation, right. And you try to fit the data to the model. And for example, you can come up with these three uh, clusters. A fourth type of algorithm is called density based clustering. We will not talk about it in this class if we do not have time, but it is based on the similarity, you know, based on the kind of, uh, you know, based on the density of a region. The density of a region is the number of instances in a region in feature space. It locates regions of high density and connects those points together. So, DB scan is a popular density based clustering algorithm. Then we have graph theoretic clustering algorithms, which takes nodes to represent the different items and the weights of the edges is based on the similarity of the items. And based on this a graph is constructed and certain graph algorithms are used to find uh, connected, find uh, strongly strong connected components. For example, looking for minimum cut in a graph. Again, we will not talk about uh, these type of algorithms in this class. The third aspect of a clustering algorithm is the metric that we use, a distance metric or a similarity metric. So, there are certain distance metrics, for example, the Minkowski family of distance measures, where given two items x i x j, the Minkowski distance between d x i and x i and x j is computed as it takes the summation over the training examples uh, it takes the summation over sorry the number of input attributes let us say n is the input attribute x i s minus x j s to the power p, the whole thing to the power 1 by p. This is the Minkowski metric. So, one popular, you know, if you set p equal to 2, you get the Euclidean distance. In Euclidean distance, what you have is Euclidean distance of x i x j is Minkowski distance with p equal to 2, which gives you root over sigma 
s equal to 1 to n x i 1 minus x i s minus x j s whole square. This is the Euclidean distance or you can have the Manhattan distance between x i and x j as summation over s equal to 1 to n x i s minus x j s. If you set p equal to 1, you get Manhattan distance which is defined like this p equal to 2, you get Euclidean distance and you can also use p equal to 3, 4. So, this is one type of distance metric. A second metric which is often used when you work with text data in the bag of word model is the cosine distance metric. So, given two objects x i and x j or the vectors of these two objects, you find the cosine between these two vectors and the cosine between these two vectors can be computed. So, the cos of x i x j can be computed as the dot product of the vectors x i dot x j divided by root over the sum of this uh, the coefficients of this. So, which we can write as mod x i dot mod x j. This is the normalization factor and this is the dot product. So, basically what you are doing is that you are finding the cosine between the two vectors, right. Then apart from such matrix, there are correlation coefficients which are scale invariant and there are different such measures. For example, Mahalanobis distant, Pearson correlation coefficient, Spearman relation and so on. In Mahalanobis distance d x i x j is taken as root over x i minus x j sigma inverse x i minus x j. So, with this this sigma is the covariance matrix. If they are independent then this is equal to the Euclidean distance and then we have the Pearson correlation coefficient which is given by covariance of x i x j divided by sigma x i sigma x j. So, sigma x i stands for how far each of the items in a cluster is from the mean of the cluster and this is covariance of x i x j. So, these are some of the similarity metrics that are used in the clustering algorithms. The next aspect which is of importance to us is how to measure the quality of a clustering algorithm. There are two types of measures of quality. It could be internal evaluation or external evaluation. In internal evaluation, you evaluate the cluster quality by the clusters and the data that you have. Whereas, for external evaluation, you use additional data. So, for example, in internal evaluation may try to look at how close the points in a cluster are each with each other and how far they are from members in other cluster, right. There are many several such measures. One of them is the davis boldin index. davis boldin index is computed as 1 by n summation over the number of clusters. You take items belonging to the, uh, to the same cluster which are j not equal to i, you look at sigma i plus sigma j divided by d c i c j. This is the distance of c i with c j and this is the spread of sigma i and sigma j. Right? So, this is one measure of the quality of a cluster. Then, if you have some label data, but you ignore the labels and come up with a clustering of the data, you can compare the cluster that you have got with the labels that you have, right. And this gives you external evaluation. For example, there are different external evaluation metrics like F measure, Jacquard index, Rand index, etcetera. Now, we have earlier talked about defined what we mean by 
true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. To refresh your memory, let me draw this table. So, suppose this is the actual label of the data item and the actual label is plus or actual label is minus and this is predicted by your algorithm, predicted plus, predicted minus. Now, if, if you collect the set of items for which the actual label is plus and your algorithm has predicted plus, they are true positive. If the actual label is minus and your algorithm has predicted minus, it is called true negative. But if the actual label is plus, your algorithm has predicted minus, this is called false negative. And if the actual label is minus, your algorithm has predicted plus, it is called false positive. Okay. Now, the RAND index, so TP and TN, so these are the two regions where your algorithm has worked correctly. RAND index is given by TP plus TN divided by the sum of all four. So, the fraction of examples for which your algorithm has predicted the correct class. The Jacquard index is given by a Jacquard index of two sets A B is given by A intersection B divided by A union B. In this case, if you take the intersection of the predicted and the actual, what you get is true positive. These are the ones which, these are the intersection of those which both of the algorithms have predicted correctly, divided by the union of those that any of the algorithms have predicted correctly. So, this is divided by T p plus F p plus F n. So, these are some possible metrics. Then there is another common metric called F measure, which is a harmonic mean of precision and recall. Okay. Precision is true positive divided by true positive plus false positive. Recall is uh, true positive divided by true positive plus false negative and the F measure is the harmonic mean between them. Okay. So, these are some measures that are used for external evaluation. With this, I stop today's lecture. In the next class, we will start with k means, which is an example of a partitional clustering algorithm. Then, we will talk about one hierarchical clustering algorithm and we may talk about one model based clustering algorithms, which is a mixture of Gaussians. Thank you.